G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our fortnightly poll position series where we give you the scoop on the latest results from the Guardian uh, Essential Media poll. I want to begin by acknowledging that Canberra is Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The days and times for our webinars do vary, so head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find out all our upcoming events. Tomorrow we've got a great webinar coming up with uh, retired Admiral Chris Barry, the former head of the Defence Forces in Australia. He's going to be talking about climate change, leadership and responding to disasters. It should be a good one, so head on over there uh, to our website for information about that. Just a couple of quick Zoom housekeeping uh, issues. You can type questions for our panel into the Q&A box and you should be able to upvote other people's questions in there as well. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And finally, a reminder that this is a live event uh, and it will go up as a video on our YouTube channel. That's australiainstitute.tv. Um, and also the audio will be available as a Guardian Australia sorry, as The Guardian's Australian Politics Podcast, hopefully tomorrow morning. Now, Catherine Murphy, our regular panellist, is on the road this week, so I'm delighted to introduce our special guest, Paul Karp, political reporter at Guardian Australia, filling in for Catherine. Welcome, Paul. Thanks for having me. And our regular panellist, Pete Lewis, Executive Director of Essential Media. We've got more than 1,500 people registered for today's poll position, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, the budget is only a week away, or economist Christmas, as we call it here at the Australia Institute, and there's already been uh, a couple of leaks about what's going to be featured in that. Labor is dealing with some internal allegations of bullying following the unexpected death of Senator Kimberly Kitching, but in South Australia, Labor had a very big win on the weekend with Peter Melanouskas elected as the new Premier after just one term in opposition on the back of a big campaign focused on health and hospitals, amongst other things. Residents in flood affected areas of Australia remain a bit disgruntled with the government responses to the disaster and preparedness for future ones. And Obviously, the situation in Ukraine remains bleak with the Russian military appearing to target many civilian buildings and infrastructure with um, huge deaths and destruction in many cities in that country. And closer to home, the Great Barrier Reef is once again bleaching and in even more bleak news, temperatures in the Antarctic and Arctic have reached 30 and 40 degrees Celsius above normal. Um, it's all pretty alarming, Paul Carp, but I will take us back um, just to domestic politics for a bit. We're only one week out from the budget and probably only a month or, and a bit away from a federal election. Um, where are we sitting at at the moment in terms of national politics? What are some of the issues dominating the national debate? Uh, well, Scott Morrison um, has, uh, you know, tried to improve the federal government's flood response by, uh, you know, announcing cash payments for people in affected areas and to start to unlock um, the, you know, resilience fund that Labor has criticised them for, for not having spent enough of. He's also been crisscrossing the country, uh, travelling to um, states that hadn't let him in previously because of COVID rules in the case of Western Australia. He's also um, up in Queensland, these are for things announcing, you know, city deals, infrastructure projects, trying to get um, headlines in those states and associate himself with popular premiers like Mark McGowan in the case of, of, of WA. Um, so, so he's he's in campaign mode ahead of the budget. They're also um, giving a, a little bit more ahead of time of what's going to be in the budget, perhaps because Shane Warne's uh, state funeral is going to be uh, the day after and they, they think to get the budget bounce, they have to start making some of the announcements now uh, because that might cramp their style. Um, Probably a fair assessment, Paul. Shane Warne, mourned by even Mick Jagger, pretty beloved. Well, the, yeah, the breakfast TVs are, are making their ch choice about whether to, uh, you know, uh, be there for Warney or, um, you know, day two of, of budget coverage and have gone with <laughs> Warney. So that's, that's the pickle they're in. 
Um, thank you. And um, just coming uh, before we go into kind of the national slides, um, just wanted to unpack a little bit those results from South Australia on the weekend. So um, I guess there's always those regular caveats about not reading too much into a federal election from a state result, but very significant in that it is the first incumbent government to go kind of since the pandemic began. What's your kind of analysis of the wash up there? Yeah, so a decent swing to Labor, a big swing, and they were campaigning on issues of health funding and cost of living issues, which are going to be very prominent in federal Labor's campaign. Scott Morrison's, um, you know, defence of this is, oh, well, Anthony Albanese is no Peter Malinowskis, so he doesn't, he doesn't think there is a federal implication. And there is only one, um, you know, marginal federal seat in South Australia, uh, the seat of Boothby, but uh, I think it shows that uh, if if a campaign is fought on those issues, that Labor has more of a natural advantage in um, service delivery and cost of living issues, and so that's a, a bad sign for the coalition federally, who wants to talk more about national security, and if they do want to talk about the economy, it's more the jobs number rather than um, the hip pocket concerns that they want to be talking about. Yeah. Um, well, we might duck into the slides now with you, Pete. Um, so let's see if I can bring these up now. There we go from beginning. Way seamless, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Can everyone see that? Here we go. So and as and, and as Eb is um, getting these loaded, if you are listening on the podcast, theessentialreport.com.au, you can play at home and look at all the different charts as we go. So this first question that we've got is tracking over time the approval of Scott Morrison as PM. What are the results show here, Pete? Well, he's still in net negative, which was foreign territory for him um, through most of the last couple of years. Look back to February last year, 65%, 28 approved, disapprove. He's dropped 20 points off that and he's added 20 on the disapproval column. So um, there was like 1% movement. That doesn't mean anything. That's just noise. But he is in net negative. And if you go to the next slide at the moment, Anthony Albanese is in net positive, which is also new territory for him. Um, what does that mean? It means that the, um, I, I think the opposition leader does have the wind behind him. Um, we'll talk about some of maybe the side drafts over the last week um, a bit later. I see that where we are at the moment is that we've got an unpopular prime minister and a opposition leader who is becoming increasingly known and the more that people know about him, the more they're inclined to trust him with their vote. Um, if we then move along to preferred PM, mm. uh, much movement in these numbers? Um, uh, there isn't really, is there? There's a little bit one point either way. Um, what I can, though, tell you is, as I quickly go through my emails from yesterday, where our stand-in for John Remington, the terrific Rob Lever, has given me some numbers. This is the best performance in terms of, of preferred prime minister and opposition leader has had um, in quite some time. So before the May 2019 election, it was Morrison 39, Shorten 32. So Albo's four better than that. It was 39, 31 before the July 2016 election that Turnbull won. Um, Abbott v Rudd um, was 41, 22 to Abbott, believe it. That's a long time ago. Um, <laughs> actually, that was... PM opposition. So I think it was actually Rudd was ahead of Abbott, but he won anyway. And Gillard was ahead of Abbott 47-35 in September 2010. So, so not he a is huge in, kind of a change from last week, but certainly a positive trend overall. Look, it's I hate preferred PM as a tool. I think we've spoken about this in the past. Preferred PM is asking you to rate somebody who is PM with someone who isn't and make an objective judgment. It's an easy one that we put in. I'm not quite sure why we do, but there it is. 
And it says that in terms of recent history, he's as well positioned as any opposition leader, including a couple that have won elections. I want to come now, Pete, to the floods. Um, obviously, we've seen huge and just devastating scenes from Lismore and elsewhere along the East Coast. Um, so you've asked this question overall, how would you rate the federal government's response to recent flooding in Queensland and New South Wales? Take us through these figures. Well, you know, the short, the short answer is nothing special. 5% of people think it's been very good, 21% quite good, 41% um, in the poor or very poor column. Again, if you're playing from home, you can have a look at um, some of the cross tabs that we've got on essentialreport.com.au, um, particularly amongst coalition voters. Um, the number that think it's poor is 21%. You'd be concerned with that. Um, I've got a piece up in The Guardian at the moment where I'm calling the floods Scott Morrison's perfect political storm. I, I think if you look at um, some of the, the worst elements of his prime ministership, which he is so adapted, turning into quotable quotes. It's cold, don't be afraid. I don't hold a hose. It's not a race. It all comes together in the northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland floods. Climate change meets government incompetence, meets lack of planning. Um, and it's going to stand there as a living testament to government failure over the next few weeks and months. This isn't going to be cleaned up anytime soon. So I think this has been, well, it's obviously been catastrophic for the people that live in the flood region, but I actually also think it's been catastrophic for the Prime Minister. It's a proof point of his weaknesses as a leader, but it is also a reminder that if you want to run on national leadership in a time of war or pandemic, you actually don't have the runs on the board to say, I'm the safe choice. I think it's very, very dangerous for the Prime Minister. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've just come back from um, Western Australia uh, talking to voters in, in marginal seats. And yeah, what, one event in politics uh, or, or your handling of one issue rarely, you know, do, you know, dooms you to defeat. But when something becomes a pattern, uh, then, then that can harm you. And it, the, the, the problem with the floods is that I, I was hearing from, from voters, even, you know, in Western Australia, a million miles from, from where the floods were, that this brought back to their minds the handling of the bushfires. I think people were more likely to mention the Hawaii holiday because there was another, another natural disaster going on that they didn't think that the Prime Minister was handling particularly well. So, yeah, a, 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 a likely to solidify people's poor impression of his leadership. Yeah, if you yeah. actually look at this term of government, it's basically been a global pan pandemic bookended by two catastrophic climate events. And that's the story. Yeah, uh, if you think about it, which I hadn't in those terms, it's quite something, isn't it? But Paul, I was just going to come back to your point there. I mean, uh, uh, Catherine Murphy often talks here about the longer that you're in government, the kind of more lead you accumulate in your saddlebags. So that's really what we're seeing here, isn't it? There was a bit of a pre-existing um, perception of the government not dealing with these issues now and then everything subsequently is just kind of reinforcing that, I guess. And I don't think Scott Morrison has changed his campaign tactics from 2019 uh, when, he's up, when he was an upset victory uh, because at that time he was campaigning as, as a relative clean skin. You know, Labor let him get away with, you know, reintroducing himself to the Australian public as, as Prime Minister, doing all the, the, the hokey photo ops. I mean, he's trying the same playbook this time. And I just think that... Voters, uh, you know, seeing him wash hair and make gnocchi and, um, you know, at the Formula One and, or the NASCAR or whatever it was, um, they're just, it, 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 it clashes now because they're like, but don't you, don't you have a job? Aren't you the prime minister? You know, don't we want to hear about how you've been doing in that job and, and not the photo ops of doing everyone else's? Yeah. And before we kind of, I guess, move on to some of the other slides um, from the Guardian Essential poll this week, um, the government response, if you can just unpack that a little bit, because 
Some of the perceptions, I guess, were that it took a while for the army to be on the ground. There was that um, issue of Byron and Ballina missing out on emergency disaster relief that looked partisan, especially in the light of other car park rorts and sports rorts and all those kinds of things. Um, how much has the government been able to ameliorate some of this with handouts and, and other responses, or is it just all a bit of a, a soup at the moment? Well, I think they've rectified Byron and Ballina, but uh, yeah, it's, it's the, the, the problem of having missed out at first instance um, it, 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 that, that leads people to be concerned that there's a partisan basis for it. And, you know, the, uh, the army call out uh, was it was again will remind people of the that issue in the bushfires where it became a federal state thing. You know, is he blaming the premiers for not having called the army in sooner? Didn't we have legislation that was to fix that to allow the Commonwealth to to act more unilaterally in that sort of situation? Did that not go far enough, or was that trigger not pulled? Why was that not pulled? And it's it's one of those things where. Even if even if the states could have called them out sooner, that he's the prime minister, so he'll get blamed for that. Yeah, um, I'll just go back to the slides in just a second, but um, just a reminder for everyone on the line today. Yeah, we will be talking to retired Admiral Chris Barry, former chief of the Defence Force here in Australia, tomorrow. And one of the points he's made, I think, um, in the Guardian as well, is that if we're calling the ADF out for all these um, compounding disasters, if we have an actual national security threat, you know, what are we going to do? What's our long-term plan in a global warming sense where we're expecting more intense and more frequent extreme weather events like we've seen this year? You know, can we always be relying on, uh, on the ADF? Um, so coming back here, this was the response to the floods. Pete, um, keeping on this theme, you've got a couple of questions here related to attitudes um, to the floods in Queensland and New South Wales. Right at the top, if there isn't significant action on climate change soon, we can expect, expect flooding in Australia to be even worse. Oh, did I? There we go. To be even worse in the future. Uh, about half of respondents agreeing with that. What are these other um, attitudes that we're talking about today? Yeah, it's really it's really interesting when you see 57% support and you go, well, what about the other people? But there's 18% that are disagreeing and then you've got 25% that are, need, are either neutral or unsure. I guess the reason we're asking this is just to test the salience of some of the arguments that we on the progressive side of the movement are tempted to, to run out during these sorts of events. And I think it's just a, a reminder that we can't assume that everybody sees the world the same way. And there's obviously persuasion pieces that need to occur as well. Um, I was surprised at the strength of the coal message there. So we asked a question, if we're serious about reducing the future impact of floods, Australia needs to replace coal with new renewables as soon as possible. 53% are up for that. I was surprised it wasn't higher. 18% um, against, and again, again, the others sitting on the fence. And then the final one we asked, and these are statements that we were checking degree of support or, or disapproval. We call it a five point spread from strongly agree to strongly disagree. The government has contributed to the extent of the recent flooding in Queensland and New South Wales by not doing enough about climate change. So that's one's actually not just sheeting responsibility for the response, but sheeting responsibility for the actual impact of the floods. And that's 46% of people agreeing, 26% yeah, disagreeing. And so that is getting close to, you know, a national majority that don't just see a flood and say the government needs to do something, but see a flood and says the government has caused it. So that's, you know, interesting. Um, Paul, does anything stand out to you from those responses there? Well, I mean, what stands out to me is that um, the Prime Minister at the, uh, at the first town hall that he did at Sky was saying that we should be keeping the coal power plants going as long as possible. So although, Peter, you are surprised that it's, um, it's not higher than 53%. Uh, still a majority, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, 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 it shows the problem that he has that he's still trying to talk to um, the, the, the plurality or the, or the minority that, that disagree on that question. Um, so that, that one stands out to me. And yes, uh, 
although it is a minority, to be uh, blaming the government that directly is uh, it would be also a very concerning result at the bottom. Yeah, I mean, it's not far away from one in two people. Uh, that's got to be concerning you um, about, yeah, that, um, I guess, reinforcing perception of some of the failures of, of the government. Pete, um, walk me through this next one on some... Uh, truthiness. This truthiness. is much... This is my truthiness slide. So my, my other caution with all these numbers is that I don't think Morrison's dead yet and that his persona of ScoMo is his greatest protection. I've been observing in focus groups in recent weeks a really interesting tell. If people call him ScoMo, they're more likely, and these are low information, low engagement voters, but if they call him ScoMo at the start, they're more likely to say, well, you can't blame him. No one could have seen the pandemic going. He's tried really hard. So that sort of persona that he's built, which is based on, you know, a whole bunch of different lies, um, is a really effective um, <clears throat> insurance policy for him in terms of keeping at least, you know, people look at the polls and go, well, how can you even have 40% plus still approving? It's because they see ScoMo. They don't see a prime minister not doing his job. Yeah. So on, in that context, I think it's interesting to ask, so what do you believe? Because the, the point is the election won't be this considered policy debate. It is going to be a contest of competing realities. In ScoMo's reality, he's been a great leader through the pandemic. He, um, he looks great. He understands people. He supports the Sharkies. He's, He's an average guy, he plays the ukulele, he's the sort of guy that we should have leading the country. So on that, I was just interested who believes what during an election campaign. So let's start off with politicians. Um, so we gave people four options, almost always true, generally true, but sometimes untrue, generally untrue, but sometimes true, and almost always untrue. Um, with politicians, we have a grand total of 3% believing what they say is almost always true, another 24% more truthful than not. So just 27% of the electorate think that when they hear a politician, they're more likely or not to hear the truth. In contrast, 59% um, are, are likely to think it's a lie. Um, it's similar numbers, but a bit less in the lies um, on social media. On social media platforms, 26% truthy 54% um, lies. The, the media rates the highest. It's got 47%, which is still less than 50%, Mr. Carp, for your, for your profession. 47% believe that if they're tuning into mainstream media, such as newspapers, TV and radio, I guess that includes News Limited, 47% um, um, think it is either largely or somewhat true, but 42% don't believe it. And the most trusted source is your friends and family, where we're up to at least a majority, 56% think it'll be largely true or very true, 27% untrue. My problem with that is our only source of truth is getting all their views of current affairs and the world from the other things that no one believes. So we've got <laughs> this cycle of untruths and parallel realities that's washing around us and we're trying to come up with you know, consensus and national um, purpose in a world where no one believes anything they're hearing from anyone. Yeah, it's a bit of a worry, Paul Carp, heading into an election where uh, truth is uh, a bit more important uh, than usual. Um, although I guess you could argue it's always important. But um, what do you make of that trust or untrustworthiness of, of the media there, Paul? Uh, well, yeah, I, I think that, I think the trust in individual outlets uh the, the the results vary greatly the abc is generally more trusted than news corp for example and we can't see that disambiguated in in these results but um i definitely think that people sort of choose their own choose their own truth and in talking to voters in wa uh, particularly people that were very anti-vaccine mandates some of them were like incredibly thoroughly researched. It's just that they were, you know, quoting highly questionable uh, facts about died with versus died of COVID and, and incredibly selective use of official information or, or, or using discredited sources. So yeah, people, people choose what they want to believe. Um, Pete, moving on to this next slide here uh, and from the trust or otherwise in 
various people. You've asked here about the extent to which people support or oppose a couple of different issues, including truth in political advertising. That one looks like a winner. But um, well, like all of these are overwhelming support for action to deal with an ecosystem that is no longer trusted or truth based. So we're talking there 79% either strongly support or support the proposition we should have lies, laws, sorry, Freudian slip, <laughs> requiring truth in political advertising. Now, there's been a few goes at that and it's been ruled, I think, unconstitutional, Paul. Um, and I know it's something the Australia Institute's been pushing hard with their broader democracy project. But the second one there, laws requiring digital platforms such as Facebook to stop the spread of disinformation, 73% support. Actually, the government slipped out with little fanfare a proposal to do exactly that yesterday based on ACMA reviewing the industry self-regulation of disinformation, which has been carrying on for the last 18 months and has been totally impotent. So the government is now saying we are going to increase ACMA's powers to enforce, um, to, to force the platforms to take more active measures on dangerous disinformation. And then the third one was the enforceable, enforceable ethical standards for media companies, regardless of whether they're television, online, radio or print. And again, overwhelming support. This is 73% support. The last time this was tried was when Stephen Conroy was communications minister and News Limited ended up putting him on the front dressed as Stalin because it becomes state control. The media hates the idea of any accountability. But I do think when we talk about disinformation, it's really easy just to talk about the platforms. And I love to talk about the platforms because I think their business model is fundamentally broken and flawed. But we also need to talk about major news outlets that just do not have any accountability whatsoever and just see their accountability as being to give their readers what they want in a world where people are choosing their own truths. And I think we're seeing that playing out in some of the headlines that are just overwhelming us over the last week. Yeah, thanks, Pete. And just a word on truth in political advertising. Um, there are certainly ways to get around those constitutional implications. Uh, and certainly uh, at the state level, um, South Australia and the ACT already have existing truth in political advertising laws and other states are looking at it um, as well. So it's a, a bit of a live issue and uh, always good to think about in the context of an election. Um, we might just move on to these last couple of slides. We've got voting intentions. Yeah, these are like the funny pages. These are just the comics. So this, this is the two party, um, two, two party preferred plus, 2PP plus and primary vote. As you can see, there are still 7% undecided. I don't get too carried away except to say Labor's in a slightly, of those declared voters, Labor's in a slightly better position, but the election is by no means over. When I talk to people about the actual seats Labor needs to pick up, people find it hard to find a path to victory. But when you feel about the overall trend and the wave for change, there seems to be a chance. Um, I think South Australia was interesting if you watch that election, just when the waves on, seats go that you don't expect. So, um, you know, we're probably six weeks out now. Um, yeah. I am, I, I feel I've reached a degree of wisdom that should be described as Socratic. I've got no idea what happens. <laughs> um, and quickly, we've just got the primary vote. Here. Oh, God, I keep accidentally touching it. Primary vote with don't knows here. 37-37. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bouncing around a bit. Obviously, ours are a bit different to those that like watching news poll. Green's down a bit. Um, the independents, I think, have taken a bit off there. Um, those little yellow and orange lines are One Nation and UAP, and who knows where they where they fall at the end of the day. And I think this is our last one, 2PP+. Plus. Yeah, so, that's what we were talking about before. It's kind yeah, of, we had the there's a gap. There, but, yeah. yeah, it's a bit different looking at it this way. There is a, a little gap there in the middle with the undecideds, I guess. So, yeah. so there you go. Like, like I say, I, I find this a great lodestar. I don't think that it's determinative. So it seems to me that Labor is as well positioned as an opposition could be leading up to an election. The Prime Minister is in significant strife with his personal regard, um, but there is still a lot of work. Um, and I think it'll be an interesting election where Labor is really trying to make it a referendum on the Prime Minister. And it, I, I'm interested to see where the energy and the enthusiasm in the campaign comes from. And I'm, I'm, you know, that, that's obviously something that we'll see over the coming months. But when you've got um, an opposition that's consciously made the choice not to run a big policy agenda, 
what are people going to get excited about? Yeah. Um, we'll move to questions from the audience just uh, in a moment. So just a reminder, you can type those questions in. You can also upvote questions from other people if you think they're good. Um, and uh, if you can do that now. Um, Paul, I did want to come back to you. Um, obviously, we're not far away from a budget, but Pete was talking there, um, you know, the election's probably going to be called pretty soon after the budget. Uh, Shane Warne's funeral the day after the budget uh, means that they're trying to spruik a lot of things now and they're not going to have the, the usual free air that they do to kind of promote the budget. How much of a problem is that in a budget where they're kind of expected to be buying votes, so to speak, a bit of a handing out candy uh, and doing as much as they can, uh, leaving nothing on the field so that, you know, um, they're heading into the election in a strong position? I think it is a big problem because... Um... Their, their efforts to tackle the cost of living uh, sound like they're going to be handouts in the budget, like cash payments to um, welfare recipients or low and middle income earners, uh, and possibly also a temporary suspension of, of the or reduction in the um, petrol excise tax. Uh, and so um, you want to get credit for that. If you're trying to buy votes, you want you want to get credit for it. You don't want people to go to the you know petrol pump and be paying two dollars a litre for petrol and not realizing that you've actually taken you know 20 cents off the excise tax for them to get that bargain basement price of two dollars a litre um so it yeah anything that uh prevents them getting the message out about uh, what they gave people in the budget is 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 uh, is a worry um and again i think that they I think that they're trying to follow the 2019 playbook in terms of the timetable of using the budget as a springboard to the election is exactly what they did last time. Uh, but there's just so much going on, like news-wise, with the pandemic and Ukraine and floods that um, I'm not sure that people are as focused on the choice as the Morrison government would like and I'm uh, in order to get value for what they're giving away and to create fear about the alternative. Yeah, I want, sorry, I, I just wonder how much money they can give to move the needle. Like I just think sending a check even for, you know, 500 or 1,000 bucks, does that change the way people see the government? I don't know. Well, and it also has the risk of, of adding to inflation and uh you know the the, the 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 business lobby like the chamber of commerce and industry have said not to do it because then it, it increases the likelihood that interest rates will rise you know and that would be the worst case that would be the nightmare scenario for scott morrison would be an interest rate rise in the campaign uh rather than after it um, because they splashed too much money in the budget and is it um you know obviously Coalition's been in government for many, many terms now, and it uh, certainly all the way up until the pandemic hit, rested its laurels on its economic management, on the fact that it cared about def debt and deficit. It was for small government and not a lot of spending. Um, to what extent do voters care that splashing cash like this is kind of contrary to everything that they're, <laughs> they're supposed to believe in? Is there any issue there? Um, in terms of economic management being a really strong area, supposedly for the coalition, um, you know, how much has that been undermined by um, how they've behaved during the pandemic, where they have really had big interventions, big public spending programs? I think uh, they could lose a few votes over that. Uh, some people might flirt more with the you know, sort of right wing reactionary parties um, more if they're concerned about. Uh, debt, uh, and you, you also it, it. If people think that the money was poorly targeted, like you do, still hear voters talking about. Sure, JobKeeper was great, but didn't companies get that that turned out not to need it and wasn't a lot of that wasted? Um, so even even middle of the road undecided voters um, are susceptible to Labor's messaging about like we'll spend is fine but like it's got to be targeted or it's or it's waste yeah um i've got a question here that might be for you pete and a quick one to deal with straight up it's from john mcgee asking do the seven percent undecided relate in any way to the five percent informal vote 
I think we'd have to have probably someone from the AEC on to, to help yeah. us with that one. Look, we don't know. Um, that's a fair assumption, but it's also um, something that we can't... We, I, I, it'd be interesting to test, do you intend to vote informal? Maybe we'll do that one time just to see what it looks like, actually. You, but I think, I think it's really important when we do our polling just to look at all these different groups who are disengaged. Yeah. I think you should ask that because uh, I, I think there's going to be a record informal vote this time. Because informal votes are usually uh, people who don't don't understand how to fill it out correctly. Whereas I think this time you're going to get those people and people that are doing it intentionally because they're upset at how involved the government was in the pandemic response. I met a lot of voters who were saying that they they do not want to express a preference between Scott Morrison and Anthony Albanese. And for them, preferences aren't a way of preserving the value of their vote. It is an illegitimate way that their vote for, you know, minor parties is, and independence is being funneled to someone that they don't want to help elect. So I think a lot mm. of people will number a couple of boxes and then just stop. Mm. Um, the next question I've got is from Alistair McCulloch. He asks, how much impact do you think Russia's invasion of Ukraine is going to have, given the tendency for wars to help the party in power and also to some extent governments of a conservative persuasion? Paul, I might throw that one to you first. I think that when it first broke out, everyone thought, oh, well, the coalition's finally got their khaki election. That's a boon for them. But I think Counterintuitively, it hasn't worked out that way uh, for a few reasons. I mean, first of all, the response is completely bipartisan. Labor supported absolutely everything they did. Second of all, it does feel quite remote to people um, being in Europe and, and the, the links to the fact that, you know, this might mean to make China's aggressive action more likely. I, I don't think that's really been driven home and, and people accept or, or feel that as, as a real threat. And, and the other thing is, although Labor's only a little bit ahead uh, in, in voting intention, time is running out to, uh, you know, set this election up as being a, a referendum on, you know, we don't know what Anthony Albanese is going to do, which is the way Morrison wants to frame it. And perhaps he has some insidious plan in mind, like they accused, you know, Shorten of, of wanting to introduce an inheritance tax. And I just think that, uh, it occupies so much of the news and it sucked up so much of the oxygen on an issue where the parties don't disagree. And it, it is taking time away from the PM to frame the election as being about Albanese. Yeah, that's the critical question. It's who needs the airspace more. So I think there is no difference in the public's eyes between the major parties in handling Ukraine. I think the government's had a crack at trying to drag it back to China um, I, our polling a few weeks ago said that people actually think Labor would do a better job than the coalition in, at managing that complex relationship anyway. But it does take oxygen out of the news cycle. So the question is, does Labor need the oxygen to establish Anthony Albanese as an alternate prime minister more than Morrison needs the oxygen to make Albanese a threat? Because I don't think any, I don't think you need any I don't think we need any more airtime to make out the case on who Scott Morrison is and the sort of leader is. It's really about who is going to benefit more by having a focus on the alternative. And I'd love to say I knew the answer to that. I, I don't. But I do think that um, as it stands at the moment, it's more the, the space it fills rather than the issue itself that is relevant. Yeah. Um, and as you said, Pete, um, past polls, you've kind of asked a lot of questions around that idea of a khaki mm -hmm. election and there wasn't actually much in it there. The next question I've got is from Ian Paulin and there's a couple of others that are um, back to this idea of the, the budget and the timing of it. Um, uh, so Ian says, I know the budget is supposed to make a difference to political fortunes, but on this occasion and for this election, is it a bit more irrelevant and is it too little, too late. So we've talked about some of the other competing things there, but yeah, Paul, what are the opportunities for the government to really shift the needle on some of that lead in the saddlebags that we were talking about earlier? Oh, uh, well, I, I think, I, th I think last time people thought, oh, it, it's a budget, but it, how could that possibly, um, 
cleanse them of the the record of having dumped a you know a, another prime minister and the chaos and all the rest of it but then uh you know the campaign rolled around and all the all the money you know came out for for the the, the commuter car parks and the sports grants and and those those things were gave them lots to campaign on at a local level um in individual electorates so i think we're likely uh, to see that again hopefully not as egregiously rorted as with color coded spreadsheets, but um, I I do I do think it helps uh, to give them something to, to campaign on. Uh, but it, it depends whether people vote based on what they think they personally will get, or whether they're more concerned with uh, the record across the last three years. I reckon the there's the national budget and there's the campaign budget. So the national budget is really how. You know, the last the last pre-election budget was the back in black budget where they um, had a heroic statement that in some time in the future, which has obviously never occurred, the budget would be back in the black. Um, what what is what is that great iconic thing? Is it two percent unemployment as opposed to three percent? And does my, my problem with running on economic um, unemployment as your political, um, you know, um, Shangri-La is that. The only time people care about unemployment is when they don't have a job and when unemployment is low by definition there's fewer people concerned about unemployment so i'm not sure if that works for them they can't run on debt they can't run interest rates are only going to go one way um they might have something big on housing affordability but it'll be quite targeted and incremental over time um you know what else have they got i don't know tax they could throw some tax money at people then you've got the campaign budget, which is tax cuts meets boondoggling. And of course, they're going to run that line again. Um, this is where I think there will be an onus on the media to be calling it out in real time and not just being going along for the photo um, op ride. But it is also where I think um, Labor has caught up with them and they are making a series of announcements as the nine papers have rolled out that are very calculated as well politically. So... I think last time the Libs had a free run at this game and I don't think Labor, as in everything they're doing, they're being very, very um, disciplined and match hearted and they're not going to give them free runs this time at all. Yeah, and uh, I know the other, another concerning thing in terms of tax cuts at the election, we've already got baked into the budget these big kind of almost $200 billion worth of income tax cuts that are yet to actually come in, mostly benefit wealthier um, Australians. Um, and then, you know, potentially we might have cuts, additional cuts to the company tax cuts or additional income tax cuts. And um, while we've got some windfall profits coming in from commodities, thanks to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, helping actual receipts and government revenue, that's kind of, you know, building a real revenue problem for future governments down the track when things take a downturn. Um, the next question that I've got, Paul, I might give to you. It's from Mel Smith asking um, about the impact of the bullying allegations with regards to Kimberley Kitching. Where is that up to as we speak? I think it's unlikely to shift votes uh it it does make it harder uh for labor to make the argument about the government's um treatment of women you know too slow to implement the jenkins uh inquiry recommendations uh that that sort of argument uh but i don't think uh, although there's been a lot of very uh glowing coverage uh, of uh, Kitching's record in office from uh, mainly from other media outlets that many people know who she is or could say uh, with the you know degree of specificity what it is that labor figures are supposed to have done to her um that that warrants you know defcon 3 we must have an inquiry uh, into into the into the allegation so um, I, I, I don't think it's going to shift votes, although it is very interesting, uh, the amount of prominence that, that news outlets have, have given this story. Mm. I just say there's three things here. There's a human tragedy, there's a factional power play, 
and there is an absolute concerted attempt to politicise it by the right of politics. And all those three things are happening at the same time. And it's really careful that you separate that out. So helicopter view, clearly it's very traumatic, particularly for those close to Senator Kitchings and those that are being the subject to this ultimate mean girls pile on, which is just horrible in terms of a feminist discourse of looking at um, women in power, but we'll put that aside. Step back the helicopter though, and if Morrison saw a path to winning the election, I'm not sure if spending an entire week on this issue is part of the game plan. Does it, does it really damage Anthony Albanese? Um, he was trying to link it to the ads that Albo was putting out about turning up to when there's an emergency. I think it's probably a bit inside, inside the, I don't hate the term, I hate the term, so the belt way, I hate, I hate it, but it is like, we will see. Um, I think it's been really traumatic though, and sort of particularly for those, all those involved. And the real challenge for Labor is now to find a way of unify and not allow what has been an internally really traumatic incident um, to tear apart the opposition just as they're on the threshold of an election campaign when they're well positioned to win. That's going to be the real test of leadership for both um, Albanese and the other players in this, whether they allow News Limited and the Morrison government to take a personal tragedy and turn it into a political fireball. Um, this one might be for you, Pete, and then to you, Paul, after that. Um, Alan Colligado asks, which aspect of Morrison's prime ministership do people approve of? I'm not sure you um, necessarily ask that when you ask about approval, do you? Do we know anything else about what people approve of in terms of... Um, Previous questions on issues? Oh, clearly some people like the vibe. They like the ukulele. They they like that he's a daggy dad if he was. Um, you know, I look to be to be fair, when Morrison's approvals was high, it was when he was taking advice in that first year of the pandemic and being prepared to change course and listen to experts and work collaboratively with the states. It was almost the George Costanza prime ministership where he did everything against his natural instincts he did okay since then he's reverted back to type of playing politics which served him very well in 2019 it may serve him well again we don't know what the future looks like but um, in terms of his positive ratings I'm not going to be able to go into much more depth than that um, I might then come to this next question from Murray Coates who asks uh, back to that question I think you mentioned earlier, how does the percentage of each party translate into seats? So that was kind of where at least the commentariat seemed to get into trouble last election. The national polling looked uh, all right. And then when it got down to the seat level, there just wasn't the electorates there um, for Labor to win. Paul, how much of a concern is that for Labor this time around? Or are the poll results looking kind of comfortable enough that enough seats are in play? Yeah, so la last time there there was a swing to Labor in but in some seats, but they were held on very large margins, and so they they were seats that didn't didn't uh, didn't help Labor in the end in the inner city particularly, and we might see a lot of that again this time, particularly in a state like Queensland, where with the exception of of Longman uh, and a few other seats, most are held, are held by the coalition on on very large margins so you know it would take a very large statewide swing to get to get lots of labor gains in Queensland that said uh, I do think that there are um, enough seats in um, northern Tasmania Chisholm in Victoria uh, Reid and Robertson in New South Wales in WA Swan Pierce Hasluck and Boothby in South Australia that we were talking about that majority government um, is is you know a possibility without you know having a double you know outsized double digit swing to, to labor I don't think they need to pick up you know three or four seats in Queensland um, Pete anything you want to add to that yeah the question is whether there's enough whether, whether the if there's a five or six percent swing whether the coalition could sandbag enough seats to still stay into power. Um, how will they sandbag it? With 
targeted campaigning, negative campaigning, big advertising buys and, um, you know, pork. Um, they've got all those assets. If they do it well, they can sandbag. Um, if it is close, I still predict the government will hold on. Labor needs to win well, and they win well, yes, with lots of seats winning, but with the tide for change. And that's where um, I think we're at at the moment. Um, the seats can, you, you can find the seats when you sort of start imagining that swing, but it is really hard to say, you know, there, there might be three or four in WA, but put two in the bag. SA Boothby hasn't really changed for over 50 years. The Tassie seats, there's a couple there that you might get. There's probably only one in Victoria. And you're right, then at least you've got to hold on to what you've got in New South Wales and find a way to win a few in Queensland. It's hard. Like it's mm -hmm. not it's not as easy as it looks from just reading the polls. Like yeah. changing government is really, really hard in Australia. The, the other thing I would say is that there seemed to be a swing against Labor in their heartland and against the Liberals in their heartland last time. And some of that, I think, is reverting back to the you know historical trend as in like I, I don't think Labor's vote has continued to erode in West and Southwest Sydney. But on the Liberal side of the equation, I'd not, I don't think it's reverting back and it's a, it, it was a one election blip. I mean, people were voting because they were concerned the coalition weren't doing enough on climate. And I think they're still facing a challenge in the inner city, um, both from the independents, but also from, from Labor in seats like Higgins and even like North Sydney, which is unthinkable. I, I grew up there and it's a very conservative area. So I, I do think that um, over a few elections, the climate issue has has bitten the coalition. Well, those showing my age, Ted Mack was a long-term independent representative of North Sydney up until the point that um, Joe Hockey found a way into parliament. And, you know, I think the Teal independents are the other wild card. And, you know, we've spoken about this before in this forum. They provide a handbrake on the coalition's worst excesses and they're also a real threat in terms of numbers in the, in the parliament. Yeah, well, some of that is uh, about the horse race, but we've just swung back to policy there. And speaking of climate, I do have a couple of questions here that go back to that issue of climate change. Um, one from John Knox and, uh, and a few others in there. But Paul, obviously with the floods and from those results we've seen today in Guardian Essential, people are making their connection um, a lot more strongly between extreme weather events and climate. We've got the, the teal independent candidates running in a lot of safe liberal seats and a budget about to come up where, you know, we've got the Great Barrier Reef bleaching 40 degrees above average in Antarctica and a government still bestowing millions of dollars in public money to expand gas fields in Australia. Um, there's still no evidence really of, a, of any kind of shift in policy that would match that 2050 commitment that they made um, so much a meal out of at, at Glasgow. Yeah, and we were, just as the rest of the world was lifting their ambition on, you know, 2030, we finally got a policy of net zero by 2050, but it uh, relies on, you know, heroic assumptions about technology. Uh, and, you know, meanwhile, we're opening up new gas fields, which will make it more and more difficult to achieve. Uh, so I, I think uh, I, I think they've done the bare minimum to 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 not have a complete mutiny in those uh, slightly more post material um, blue ribbon seats, but they haven't they haven't done enough to they haven't done enough to to uh, uh, do enough for Australia's contribution to fixing the problem. And I think people are aware of that. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Don Morris, who asks, is there a chance the federal ICAC will become a campaign issue? Paul, I'll throw that one back to you. I know that's been a particular concern, again, in those uh, safe Liberal seats where independents are running against the Liberal Party. Um, it is already backed by Labor, the Greens and the Crossbench, people like Rebecca Sharkey in the lower house, Helen Haynes, Zali Steggall, but a lot of candidates running on that as well. Integrity, is that going to be um, a strong issue in the campaign, do you think? Yeah, so I don't think that... Um... I don't think that undecided swinging voters, uh, you know, necessarily can rattle off all the features that an ICAC must have or, or you know, 
their preferred model of ICAC. But in terms of the, the view that politicians are in it for themselves and what have they got to hide, if, if one side of politics is prepared to um, offer a, a more robust watchdog, I, I do think that um, that is something that can win votes and definitely in the more uh, post-material, um, you know, blue ribbon seats where the independents have made it a, a, a core part of their campaigns. Pete, anything to add to that on integrity? I think that the teal independents have marked it. I think that there, if there were a hung parliament and that was one of their requirements, I suspect that you would have the prime minister endorsing it before you could say minority government. <laughs> um, the next question that I've got is from Liz Ryan and it's back on climate change again. Uh, it's This might be one for you, Paul. Why aren't people talking about the government just giving away our carbon credits to private profiteers? Um, and uh, will the media make um, the, help the public learn about the significance of that, both environmentally and politically? Just quickly, I think Liz there is referring to Angus Taylor releasing a bunch of people from their contracts and um, dropping the price of Australia's carbon credits. Um, but certainly the Australia Institute has raised some questions about the integrity of the existing carbon credits scheme um, in Australia. Paul, I mean, it's the net part of the net zero by 2050. Um, is there anything you can tell us on that front? Uh, well, I think there were a lot of compromises that the government had to make to get uh, net zero by 2050 across uh, the line. Uh, and, you know, it, it would be unfortunate if those actually make it more difficult to to achieve the, a, a real reduction, um, you know, you wouldn't want to trade window dressing of having the right target with, um, you know, policies that make it more difficult. Mm. And certainly a big issue for the nationals because of how much agriculture is involved in that uh, scheme of carbon credits, but also because it's um, much more difficult for, say, the agricultural sector than the electricity sector to decarbonise. So I think uh, watch this space. I think there's going to be a lot more interesting stuff come out about carbon credits and offsets and, you know, um, the decisions that we have to make there uh, in the long term. Um, just any final thoughts, I guess, uh, before we go, Paul, um, as we head to the, the budget, what should people be looking out for? I, I think that, uh, I think they should, I think that they should be thinking about not just what impacts their own household, but thinking about the vision for the country that the budget lays out generally and whether it's just a transactional thing trying to buy your vote or whether you actually think that the systems are going to be improved by what's offered in the budget. Thank you and Pete certainly we saw uh, Peter Melanowskis on the weekend talking about you know big government and having a future for the vision of his state and uh, you know trying to head towards that more visionary end of things. Uh, yeah. Any I've lessons there? Well, you know, someone that wants to run a government that believes in governing, you know, wow. Um, and it hasn't been the, um, the modus operandi over the last 40 or 50 years. So um, I think Paul's right. The budget is a test of what the government believes. And it's also his last shot in the locker, really. He needs to reload pretty quickly. So, you know, and I think one of the things is there'll be a lot of noise amplified by the government's friends in the media Um and the question is going to be whether that takes fire or if it's just, you know, a lot of noise and then we're off to Warney's funeral. Mm. Well, we might have to wrap it up there. Thanks very much for your questions, everyone. We had upwards of 800 people on the line with us today. We can't get to all of them. I really do apologise. Thank you to Paul Carp, our special guest this week, filling in for Catherine Murphy. Uh, we really appreciate your time so close to the budget. Thank you, Pete, for all your excellent analysis. And don't forget, 
to check out and sign up for the Australia Institute's webinar tomorrow with retired Admiral Chris Barry uh, about climate leadership and responding to disasters. That should be a really great one to check out. Our podcast is Follow the Money. You can subscribe to that wherever you find your podcasts along with Guardian's Australian Politics podcast, where hopefully the audio from today will be up um, tomorrow. Don't forget to head on to Guardian Australia for the latest analysis from Paul and Catherine of the Essential Media result, um, poll results today, as well as Pete's column as well. And head on over to the australiainstitute.org.au for all our latest research and content. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you in a fortnight's time, if not tomorrow. We really appreciate your company. Stay safe out there, everyone, and we'll see you soon. All right.